Thank you very much, Robert, um, RJ, to you and your panel for the important discussions on trends in the oil industry, um, especially in such uh, a dynamic and challenging year uh, due to COVID-19. Uh, we're going to shift the conversation to focus uh, on the electricity grid now, uh, which was also vulnerable uh, to demand fluctuations and the climate-induced crisis around the world in 2020. Uh, I'm Philip Cornell. I'm a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and also a principal at the Economist Group, um, and I'll be leading uh, this panel discussion this morning. Uh, indeed, the pandemic came on the heels of major changes already taking place over the past years in the electricity sector, both in terms of traditional utilities navigating uh, ever more liberalizing energy markets, uh, the rise of distributed energy and off-grid producers, much larger integration of variable renewables, uh, and greater cross-border and inter-regional electricity trade. Uh, those changes were tested by the low demand, high renewables impact uh, of COVID, and in many ways uh, accelerated those trends. Uh, so I would like to introduce uh, our panel today. Uh, Dr. Mohammed Hilal Alzabi is Executive Director of Regulatory Affairs at the Abu Dhabi Department of Energy. Uh, Dr. Beatrix Nader is Executive Vice President of Transmission at Siemens Energy. Uh, and Mr. Michael Train is President uh, of Emerson and Chairman of Emerson Automation Solutions. Uh, and let me please remind the audience that you can use the conference app to submit questions at any time uh, through the discussion. Uh, so please, uh, Mohammed Hilal, let me start with you. Uh, Abu Dhabi has really been at the forefront of the transition to advanced energy and grids uh, in the Middle East. Uh, how did the UAE react to the cross-sectoral impacts of the pandemic, uh, especially in regard to energy? And what were some of the lessons learned across the Arab world from the global pandemic uh, and its impact on the electricity system? Thank you, Phil, uh, for uh, allowing me to give or share some of the experiences that we've had in, in, the, in Abu Dhabi when it comes to the pandemic impact over the past few months or the past year. As you know, there was uh, uh, an impact of uh, the demand of uh, the power, uh, sub, uh, the demand on the power or, or energy needed in Abu Dhabi uh, during the early stages of the pandemic, which was as a, as a result of the lockdown, similar to what happened all around the world, we saw a trend of a, a reduction of the demand of up to 20%, uh, mainly driven by the lockdown due to the close of uh, shops, commercial sectors and industrial sector. And that trend we've noticed uh, also uh, not only in parts of the Arab world, but also in Europe and uh, much parts of the world. However, uh, uh, the COVID impact fr from Abu Dhabi perspective and from the regulatory point of view as what I do here in Abu Dhabi, uh, we wanted our target from many years ago is to be resilient regarding whatever the event was. So we wanted to react quickly. So the immediate thing that happened uh, uh, in Abu Dhabi was to be close to the operators in the sectors, be close to the power generators, be close to the technology providers, whether they are solar, whether they are nuclear. And here in Abu Dhabi, we launched our, we act, we, we launched our first, first nuclear reactor during the pandemic. So we, and, and we have invested and announced more investments during the pandemic. How, even though we saw a huge reduction uh, sim, similar to the trend, but we thought that this was a more of a temporary thing. And the, uh, the, what we've seen over the past, in the, during the summer period, even the peak demand in, in the summer due to the easing of the lockdown uh, surpassed uh, all the previous years when it comes to the demand. So we have reached the peak, unlike many other countries. Um, having said that, there, there are a lot of lessons learned that we have seen in Abu Dhabi. And the, the key thing uh, to avoid any issues when it comes to uh, addressing the pandemic issues was the close collaboration between the regulator, the operator, 
all the government entities, including the, for example, in Abu Dhabi, the Department of Health was very close to us to make sure that not only uh, uh, the safety of people working on the in the plants, so there was a very close coordination between us. Uh, the private sector was very active. He was, they were, they were, uh, I would, and I would like to thank them. What they've done is an extraordinary job during the pandemic, trying to address the safety on, of the people and making sure that we have uh, continuity, business continuity when it comes to uh, supply of power and water to all customers. So I think uh, we did not see any any major issues to when it comes to supply side. Uh, the demand side fluctuated, but for us, it eventually recovered. And if you are referring me to the uh, what's happening in the rest of the Arab world and uh, the rest of uh, the world, actually, I would say it's mostly similar. We saw we've we've done our own studies, and we've seen a similar reaction uh, worldwide. Uh, and and that for us in Abu Dhabi, that did not impact our uh, policies when it comes to the investments of renewables in the future. So we thought from our perspectives, for example, the renewables are matching the peak demand, which is in the summer. That's where we need the renewable renewable energy most. And that's where uh, it matches perfectly with our uh, demand profile. So uh, our plan for the future has not changed. We believe that the economic recovery will happen quickly, uh, hopefully faster than what everybody's anticipating. Uh, but uh, our investments and our uh, uh, renewable energy mix will still remain as forecasted previous prior to the pandemic. Great. Uh, thank you very much. I mean, it's clear that grid resilience is tied to the resilience of staff and the health of the staff that maintains uh, business continuity along those grids, uh, which are obviously changing quite a bit, uh, including in the region. Um, uh, Beatrix, uh, the, the pandemic really tested electricity systems um, that are becoming uh, more complex uh, at the distribution level and also with regard uh, to transmission and long distance electricity delivery, which is sort of the focus of your business. Mm -hmm. uh, from your perspective, what has been the biggest disruption in power transmission, uh, let's say, over the past decade? Thank you for that question, because it's really, um, from our perspective, um, great that we have uh, additional opportunities now in the long distance transmission grids to further innovate, which we did not, to be honest, have so much in the past. Some of that has already been mentioned. Uh, the resilience of the grid is becoming an issue. We are moving away. Uh, let me summarize it or uh, uh, describe it like this. We have actually three main uh, elements of disruptive um, impacts on the grid. The first one is, of course, the renewable infeed, which is changing the grid uh, from a linear uh, transmission, a reliable transmission uh, system into having to manage fluctuating infeeds. And also because most of the renewables are installed to generate the big capacities needed offshore with wind, we also have a decoupling from uh, the generation part and the de uh, demand part on a global basis that has to also be handled by the grids. Um, that together with the fact that we are also closing uh, increasingly so the generation on CO2 based uh, fuels is destabilizing the grid or has to uh, uh, lead into um, investments in stabilizing the grid to handle this um, 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 influences, essentially taking care to keep the frequency. This is one big topic uh, and that has been mentioned already. Grid stability is uh, an additional need now to be invested and the good news is it's done. And the further good news is we have the technology to do so and on a worldwide basis, I can confirm uh, everyone is active in ramping this uh, technology up and including it. The second topic, which is having an influence, we should not underestimate, is uh, the technology aspect of digitalization. For the first time in our history in transmission grids, we are able in real time to measure the behavior, the physical behavior of our products in the grids. This has never been possible before, 
in um, uh, because it was uh, too expensive to do so. But now the technology is there. It's a cheap technology, digitalization. It's a plug and play technology. We just have to do it. What we need is the data we have. We call it IoT, as everyone else, Internet of Things. Each and every product of a, an element of a transmission system it can be connected, and we do connect it to the cloud. And now we can add uh, to our automation technologies for the grids additional aspects which we are needing. That's simulation, that's prediction, predictive um, behavior of the grids, and we urgently need that to further stabilize. And of course, we are now much better able to uh, connect grids with each other, as you have been saying today, at some point to form a super grid. And um, these three items or these three elements are new or to the extent uh, we see them now. And again, as I said, um, we are on it. And the even better news uh, in that context is there are investments being made uh, to do that. Uh, a lot of our um, uh, grid operators and, and utilities are announcing that they will invest in renewables and in the grid. Uh, Europe has been announcing that it will invest 800 billion to boost um, uh, the wind power and the grid connection until 2050. So we see that on a worldwide basis and it is done. So to sum it up, three aspects are now uh, in the focus, again in the focus for grid operators specifically in the transmission area, that's grid stability, grid resilience, specifically to make sure that we are increasing uh, our, the performance of our um, infrastructure and grid automation. Thanks so much, Beatrix. It's very clear that transmission in the, in the sector, uh, transition in the sector is being aided by, uh, uh, by technology and, and technological advancements. Um, and for that, Mike, I'd like to come to you last, um, since I think you have a really interesting perspective on some of the trends uh, that we saw across global regions. Um, and, and your company is really sort of at the forefront of integrating a lot of those technologies that, that Beatrix has talked about. What are some of your observations on how COVID tested power generation and grid technology in different parts of the world and accelerated uh, the adoption of some of those advancements? Philip, thank you. It's a pleasure to join everybody here on the panel and, and uh, everybody around the world. You know, first and foremost, I'd like to salute everybody in the critical infrastructure and essential services. You know, the work, I think Mohammed referenced it a little bit, the work that was accomplished around the world to keep everything up and running was, was terrific. And, uh, you know, energy, electricity, all of these systems really, really performed in, in very challenging times where we sort of threw our playbook of for, for um, how to be resilient, but we had all of these things happening simultaneously and globally simultaneously, which, which was tremendous. So love, love to celebrate the work and the workers and, and the process here. You know, we saw that electricity demand generally dip. It may have been different in Mohammed's region, but we saw generally a 2%, 3%, 4% type of uh, drops in electricity. Very pronounced in the first half of 2020. Obviously there was some recovery in the second half of 2020. Uh, you know, the behavior around, let's say, the power generation facilities, we saw a lot of those facilities uh, really minimize their manning in those facilities. They cut back on their project activity, obviously. Uh, they deferred maintenance. You know, they really went into a mode to kind of make sure they could kind of survive a period of time and stay really focused. And, um, you know, when we're continuing to see now, they're starting to come back at this point in time to do some of those more traditional outage activities to, to sustain those facilities. and and enhance them. So we, we did see a lot of a lot of navigation, let's say, of, of kind of operating uh, out there around the world. Um, I think the digital tools, just like in our office daily lives, came to the forefront in our facilities, our control systems, the, the software assets. You know, many of those tools were there. Uh, Beatrix referenced simulation and some of the uh, analysis tools. Uh, I think all of a sudden, with some remote work now being called upon, remote operational activities, those tools got discovered, they got pressed into action, and I think they performed really well uh, for everybody around the world, which was which was really fun to see. And it's probably reshaped some management team thinking and maybe the speed at which we're gonna be uh, embracing these as we go forward. You know, some of the tools that we have around control systems and, and, and putting control systems online, if you will, you know, we had designed to be able to have remote office 
uh, participations, right? So you could have different offices around the world participate. I don't think any of us ever imagined we'd be having remote factory acceptance tests from our living rooms with our kids and our dogs in the background <laughs> uh, running around, but we did that. It was, it was amazing that we were able to press these tools into those places. So, uh, and I think the final thing is around on the demand side of electricity, the shaping the daily demand part of electricity, you know, that changed. Mohammed mentioned, you know, we had a lot of commercial centers that uh, were reduced in activity. Some of those daytime, nighttime, you know, demand peaks were different so in many parts of the world. They've softened a little bit. And again, our, our, our electricity providers had to adjust to that to be able to, to manage the kind of those around the clock uh, kind of implications. So lots of different things here, but, but again, I salute the world. I mean, everybody was able to keep their systems up and running. Our energy providers were able to get energy to these facilities. And I, and I think everybody did a terrific job. Great, thanks very much. Um, uh, it seems very much that, you know, well, Beatrix, you mentioned, for example, the role of super grids. Um, and it seems that, you know, the trends that had been going on uh, went very much to uh, both inter greater interregional transmission, we've seen originally in Europe, also very much seen it in your region, uh, Mohammed, with uh, the rise of the GCC interconnection. Um, and at the same time, uh, you know, there's also a move towards local distributed energy resources and mini grids. Maybe Beatrix, what, what do you see as kind of the right mix of both this larger interregional transmission trend and also the more distributed trend and how do they work together uh, as we go forward? That's a very good question. And um, uh, for sure, uh, not the end uh, with my answer um, will be found, but uh, I believe that both of course are necessary uh, and uh, we cannot um, um, give up on uh, transmission grids simply because we will uh, further in have to invest in the electrification. Uh, we assume or we, we think that the electricity demand will double until 2050 from uh, today's perspective. So we will, uh, of course, who have expand uh, the transmission capacities and the resilience of this. But we also need to distribute the grids further in uh, the demand area. And there we have additional um, opportunities to integrate um, electrification like cars, uh, like uh, heating, um, everything that's being currently done in order to uh, reduce the CO2 footprint uh, will be having uh, a very important, uh, play, plays a very important role specifically in the cities. Both of these uh, grids are working together very well. And as um, um, Mike pointed out, uh, the technology is there uh, to make sure that the information is shared between the two elements, the transmission and the distribution grid, and that we at that point uh, of the interface have enough intelligence uh, to handle the information properly. We, but we will also need specifically, uh, I think in both areas, uh, some storage uh, um, or, um, investments in order to um, yeah, um, stabilize the whole system, especially in the interface. So uh, I believe that both will grow and especially in the distribution area, we will be having more uh, information from the um, uh, user side, from the, um, from the people uh, using electricity uh, being um, taken into account in order to handle or manage the overall infrastructure and make sure that from generation to the demand uh, centers, we have a seamless resilient system. Great, thanks. And, and maybe I could pass this also then uh, to Mohammed. I mean, uh, in Abu Dhabi, uh, what's the role that you're thinking about, for example, uh, introducing a storage and other grid stability. And also maybe you can speak a little bit about the transmission and trade in the region. I mean, how is Abu Dhabi thinking about using uh, the GCC interconnection and other kind of regional trade um, to, to introduce the kind of grid stability that we need? Thank you, Fred. I would like to also, uh, on top of uh, uh, what Beatrix said, and I completely agree with her, the need of uh, the uh, super grids and the mini grids. Uh, that, that's, however, how you design that is depends on on each region's uh, yes. need. Let's put it this way. Uh, in Abu Dhabi, yes, we 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 are interconnected. In each between, we are we are supplying power to uh, uh, within the country to many other cities. 
and also we are interconnected with the GCCIA, the regional grid, and I'm sure it's happening the same thing in Europe, where the countries are interconnected, supplying each other. Te technically, from the technical point of view, that the bigger the grid, the stronger it is, and uh, it is very important for the security of supply, helping each city or each country helping each other, because the demand profile for each country might vary in, in certain cases. Uh, when it comes to the storage, uh, we do have a battery storage in Abu Dhabi. It's a project that we commissioned a few, few years ago as a trial. We installed about 100 megawatt battery storage, which is which we see the value of today. Uh, it is helping us in the storing uh, energy at night to supply energy where we need it the most usually in the morning at the summer times. So that is something that we have experienced. We are open to do more projects in the future, hopefully. Uh, depends on the economics and the values as we see it uh, and as the technology evolves. So that when it comes to the mini grids, something that we, we like, we, we are very open to explore. Usually our, our policies are, uh, are uh, updated quickly every few years to see to cope with the technology's improvements uh, in the countries and worldwide. So we usually talk to our suppliers and the partners. We want to hear from them. Uh, yes, so I think that is a trend is that is happening worldwide, not only here in the UAE. Thanks, Mohammed. And it certainly seems that sort of the business model of storage and mini grids projects often focus around the ancillary services that they can deliver to the grid. Um, maybe, Mike, do you have a, a, a view on this? I mean, it seems that, you know, again, there's been sort of big increases in not only sort of storage and, and mini grids, but also just more distributed energy and the rise of peer-to-peer -peer energy trade um, that impact resilience and, and actually just the role of utilities, the changing role of utilities. Um, what's your what's your view on the changes from from uh, from uh, from your company's point of view? Yeah, no, thank you, and thanks for those comments. You know, the uh, distribution side of this, you know, where, where we're really close to our users, where we've got these distributed resources now, you know, traditionally generating resources. Now, we're, as Mohammed points out, we have storage resources. So we have these distributed energy resources uh, in the microgrid. So the advanced distribution management systems, the digitalization of all of this, the demand signaling. Um, I think is is clearly important as we go forward. Uh, clearly, there's I think a lot of upgrading going on right now, a lot of investment going on on the digitalization of these systems. Um, we're seeing the interest in that. We obviously have resiliency challenges, uh, you know, here in the United States side of things. California has witnessed a little bit of that with their they had their fires and some of the things going on in, in, in the physical world. Uh, but also, you know, they've they've stepped up with a lot of renewable assets. They need that, you know, that inertia, those resiliency, those dispatchable resources to be able to come to when when they need them. You know, so we're seeing a lot. I think a lot of challenge, a lot of focus, a lot of in interest, a lot of investment, and uh, and Mohammed referenced strategies. I think we're seeing strategies emerge around all of these things. So, I think the next ten years are going to be very exciting times for everybody. That's that's uh, in our electricity systems. The utilities, you know, they've all um, expressed how they're going to deal with their portfolio, their mix of generating assets, how they're shifting the mix of generating assets towards a more renewable fleet. And, uh, you know, and then how, uh, challenges around that as they go forward, they've got to make some investments around that. Uh, you know, in different utilities around the world, they have to go to their users, their customers to make sure they get approvals to make those type of investments. So. Philip, I think it's a really dynamic, dynamic area right now, and uh, technology is going to serve a good purpose here. But there's a lot of policy pieces. There's a lot of uh, kind of the economic signaling pieces that got to come to play as well. Thanks, and maybe we can follow up. I'm starting to get a few questions in from the audience, which is fantastic, and I encourage the audience to use that app and continue to um, provide some questions. We have one from uh, Robert Yeager. Uh, as discussed, the introduction of renewables can create grid instability, such as non-dispatchable non frequency and inertia issues. What software and technology tools will be needed in the future to address those issues? Maybe, Mike, we can start with you and, and then see if there are views from Beatrix and Mohammed. Yeah, I think this is where we're, you know, in our power generation facilities, of course, we've got our control systems and they're connected to their 
their grid connects and they're, they're working this, but this whole, this advanced distribution management systems, I think are where we're going to really see some investments going on. I think Beatrix, you know, would say similarly from their perspective on this, you know, really raising the ability to, uh, to view and manage all of these things, use some of these terrific digital tools. I think the simulation tools are going to be uh, really awesome in how you plan these things, how you simulate them, how you test for them, how you train your staff for them, uh, really going to be important to us as we go forward. And, the, you know, the computes around what's going on and, and the, and the uh, some of the AI tools, the expectations and the planning go on. So um, we're going to see, I think we're going to see tremendous investment in this area, Philip. And I think it's, I think it's really going to change the nature of the way the business has traditionally been run to where we're going here in the future. Absolutely. Uh, Beatrix, do you have something to add on transmission? Uh, yeah, uh, so um, this is um, really uh, a good question and also Mohamed, you also already outlined some of uh, the investments and very good um, solutions you're integrating in your grids, for instance, uh, to stabilize them. Essentially, the technology is there. The, uh, there is, for, we call them uh, flexible AC uh, uh, systems. Uh, which we add into the grid in order to handle uh, the, this uh, the asymmetry between uh, generation and, and demand. Uh, this is um, uh, uh, um, semiconductor-based technology, but we can also um, replace or simulate uh, the takeaway uh, from rotating masses by uh, using uh, generators. We call that a synchronized condenser um, uh, technology, also an option. And as Mike uh, outlined, there is on top of that always uh, no, the, really the opportunity and already existing um, uh, better grid automation solutions, which are early um, discovering or uh, working against uh, these uh, potential um, uh, stresses in the grid by um, um, yeah, uh, uh, shifting the load uh, quickly according uh, uh, in accordance. So from a technology point of view and from already investment point of view, it's all there. And I would be really um, saying, uh, I, I do say we can handle this. We are sometimes near blackout because of this, but so far it didn't happen. Which proves so the technologies are there. Great, the technology is there and the investment is there. Uh, but as Mike mentioned, Mike referenced, for example, the California experience, sometimes the regulation uh, struggles to keep up. Uh, Mohammed, um, you're sort of leading the regulatory uh, body inside the UAE. What are the lessons that you've learned from some of those uh, front runners like in California and some of the sort of uh, problems that they've faced? How do you uh, apply some of those to your own experience? Uh, I mean, for, from when I talk to my colleagues in the regulatory bodies around the world, and this is, I think, even the utility providers or the even manufacturers, something that we always have to talk to, like what we do here today. Um, the when you have whether it's renewables or any technology that uh, any technology that could cause any uh, technical issues within the grids due to the rise of that specific technology. I think uh, when it comes to this case, renewables, we have to invest even, I mean, we have some some technical solutions today, but I think, I believe we can do better in the future by doing some investments uh, to, to enhance how we control uh, the rise of the renewable uh, investments in each country. So when I look at, I mean, here in, in Abu Dhabi, we did not reach that stage, but we felt we when when the nuclear deal, when the nuclear uh, power plant started coming on board this year, I mean, we've been studying similar concept over the past uh, past let's say ten years when we announced the nuclear deal on how we can cater for new technologies into the grid, and. A lot of solutions with a lot of suppliers have been provided, and I believe we are not that far from finding solutions from these technical issues. We already have been addressing it in Abu Dhabi, uh, may, but maybe it depends on the system behavior worldwide in each country. Maybe we need to have a technical solution that could be discussed with the technical team. 
yeah, clearly, it's, we're going to need sort of a mix of the technical solutions and um, also sort of a regulatory approach. Uh, Beatrix, uh, things are seem to be changing quite fast in Germany. You mentioned uh, the changing uh, generation mix, which is causing you know, issues for grid stability. Um, and I think, for example, in Germany as well, you know, since we've seen uh, the energy venda starting about 10 years ago, also a very changing role for nuclear. Um, how do you see sort of the, the regulatory approach in Europe to those massive changes um, affecting transmission uh, and your business? Um, very similar as Mohammed said, first of all, we need it. Uh, we need um, also fast and, and efficient decision on, on this in, in this area. Uh, we are currently supported in our change or transformation into a greener, uh, resilient CO2 free grid and uh, generation infrastructure. Uh, but that is not the end of it. We will also need, um, most likely as an industry, given, as you said, the big growth uh, situation we are facing, we will also need um, some freedom in um, um, design or technici technical uh, uh, specification uh, areas in order to scale. Uh, uh, um, the investments are there, the technologies are there, uh, the need is there. And in order to manage this as an industry together with our customers, we for sure will need more standardization uh, to uh, improve our productivity and uh, serve this demand fast. Because there is a, from our perspective or from my personal perspective, we don't have much time to be su successful here. We have to have an impact on the overall structure uh, as fast as possible uh, to serve the CO2 goals. Uh, this is important, and that's why I believe the regulatory um, uh, bodies are also urgently needed to help us to find standards on a global scale that allows the industries to increase their productivity by using them. Great, Mike, and speaking about sort of technical standards and changes in the overall structure of the grid, um, that's something that an incoming uh, uh, Biden administration is going to be considering. Um, what do you see as sort of uh, changes on the regulatory side that are coming down the pike um, and that will affect sort of the uh, technical uh, solutions and standards uh, from, from your perspective? Yeah, you know, Philip, actually yeah, here in the United States and actually around the world, I, I, I believe our policymakers, our regulatory bodies, they are really engaging with, with technology companies like ourselves and, and Beatrix and others to really make sure they, they understand what's possible, what, what, what what these technologies can do. I think we need to work together on getting some at scale, Beatrix meant some scale, getting some of these at scale implementations out in the world so we can all learn from them. You know, we can uh, understand uh, their technology challenges and how they fit, but also the economics of how these things all, all play out. I have to salute Mohammed's team there in Abu Dhabi. I mean, you know, putting nuclear power into their mix, big project, really important, obviously provides a lot of that inertia Yes. that they're going to need for their stability there. They've also put a lot of renewables into their mix. They've got an at scale, one of the few, unfortunately, but we're going in the right direction, at scale carbon capture systems in the world that uh, we've been able to watch the progress around that. So, you know, I think a lot of the governments and government bodies are stepping forward to, to help us with some of these, you know, to get those practical uh, implementations done so we, so we can all collectively learn from them at the same time and then move forward with, with the strategies we've got going on. So I think that's, that, that, that's very big for us here in the near future. The Biden administration, of course, uh, yesterday uh, rejoined the Paris or expressed their interest to uh, rejoin the Paris Accord. You know, I think there's going to be a lot of uh, focus on the technology pieces of this um, from their point of view. And, and so we'll see how it plays out. They, they are reaching out to, to industry. They are reaching out to uh, thinkers, to academics. They, they, they are doing the outreach right now to really try to incorporate all of these ideas, Philip, as, as they move forward. So, And they're talking to their counterparts in Australia, in Europe, in Japan, and different parts of the world as well. So I, I do see it as a team effort here globally for all of us that, that are participating to, to move this forward. Yeah, clearly it's a it's it's going to be a global en uh, effort. Beatrix, you mentioned the same, um, you know. But we do talk about some you know places that are that are more advanced uh, and that are thinking uh, about advanced technologies and new sort of methods of of, of grid integration. Um, but at the same time, 
you know, there's also, I think in a lot of emerging markets in the developing world, um, also huge changes that are impacting energy access. Um, and that is also includes the move from traditional utilities to a much greater role, for example, for off-grid uh, uh, renewable energy solar providers, for example. Um, as we move into post-COVID recovery, um, what are some priorities for delivering uh, energy access and the reliability of energy access in some of these um, emerging markets? Uh, maybe, uh, Mohammed, if you have uh, some thoughts on this first, and then I'd love to hear from Beatrix and Mike. I mean, if you're talking about emerging markets here, I, I think, I, I think, I believe that energy, whether it's power or water, should be accessible by everybody, uh, regardless of the markets, their locations, wherever they are. So that's an essential need of any human being, whether it's uh, for human being or, I mean, whether, whether or whether, whether for, it's for industries. Having said that, that uh, to me, having uh, interconnectivity, uh, grid access to all customers, wherever they are, even between countries, even across uh, continents, I think that should be the aim for the future. Uh, the sh study should be looked at uh, and studied from economic and technical point of view, where all the emerging markets can should have access to energies. Uh, that will only cause economic growth worldwide. If once the easier access that you have for energy, the better that it will be for the world economy. In having this, having said that, I think this is a. a a target that the countries should look at in the future uh, to make sure that uh, energy is accessible, accessible wherever they are. Thank you. And, and Beatrix, transmission uh, development and expansion is happening rapidly uh, in the developing world right now. Uh, what, what is its role uh, in delivering uh, greater access? It's the backbone of the energy, as Mohammed rightfully said, and uh, thank you for saying this. I'm fully agreeing on what you said. It's a basic human right to have access to energy, and we have to make sure altogether that this is uh, achieved, that we achieve this. And in uh, the, the developing market, as you are saying, that's not the case. Uh, we will uh, not always be able to start with a big uh, power generation facility and transmission line in order to bring the supply to the cities. In a lot of cases, it's more centralized in nature. Solar and other things that are helping smaller entities uh, to gain access to energy. And I think it is important uh, to do both. In essence, what we need uh, and what would help us uh, from, a, from a supplier point of view, are uh, certainly an, a, energy roadmaps in these countries, um, which we are happy to develop, uh, all of us, I think, together uh, with these uh, countries, to first of all have a plan, uh, and then, of course, find the means uh, to realize this. Um, both is um, certainly happening uh, in some areas, but it could be more. Mike? Well, I would say one, you know, energy is obviously the backbone of our economies, right? And, and, uh, and, and there's always such a delicate economic balance that takes place for, you know, the cost of, you know, creating energy producing assets, distribution, transmission, distribution assets, reaching, reaching all of the places you want to reach. And so, you know, I think that's why I think the developed world has this role around testing these things at scale. So everybody understands how we can use the technologies and getting that cost balance so that so that a lot of these countries the developing countries can you know make confident investments you know they know that if they make the investments they're going to get the resiliency they want they're going to get the access and reach they want um you know I'll, I'll, people are different spectrums in terms of their ability right now maybe to bring on renewable assets you know from a cost standpoint or an, or an integration standpoint so we just got to work. I, I like the, the roadmap uh, point that Beatrix makes. I think we need to work with everybody to get that roadmap established with the right choices, the right economics, you know, and then support each other as, as we move forward or, uh, down, down the road. You know, we are seeing a lot of these advanced distribution uh, management projects, you know, in Europe, in Australia, in Asia, in the United States. You know, I'm hopeful that we get a little bit of experience over the next couple of years with these systems so that by the time you know, let's say a developing country is ready to make those investments, we've, we've got that proven for them. So they can, again, make those 
confident choices, those right choices for for their situations and to make the economics work and in, in whatever their whatever their uh, standing is. So I, 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 I'm, I am hopeful, Philip. I think I think there's a way to get there. Again, it's kind of this collaborative effort around the world to make it happen. Great, and and providing those kind of examples and uh, for 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 advanced distribution and for digitization on the grid, um, for for then follow on countries to adopt. Um, in order to do that confidently, they're going to have to uh, have trust, for example, in the cybersecurity uh, of the network, which is obviously an increasing concern. Uh, 2020 was a particularly active year um, for for cybersecurity threats. Um, I'd love to hear from each of you. What are what are some of the biggest priorities for for cybersecurity uh, and resilience on the grid at the moment? Uh, maybe Beatrix. Um, so thank you for giving me the chance to start. Um, I would uh, or not? I would. It is clear a topic clearly, and specifically, as we said, when we want to use data in order to further optimize our infrastructure and become smarter in terms of prediction of what is going to happen before it happens, um, we will have to also um, uh, further invest in um, in securing uh, the grid. Um, in uh, parallel to digitalization. We do have, uh, of course, already solutions which are uh, also uh, um, uh, joint effort with our customers and other industry partners for cybersecurity charter. We have a cybersecurity charter uh, as Siemens Energy, uh, which we are uh, using in our um, infrastructure. Um, but I do also think, or we are also um, focusing on the right thing. Uh, there are data and data. Control and protection is certainly something which we don't want to have anyone to interfere. That has to be protected and is therefore certainly, from our perspective, for the time being an on-premise uh, in infrastructural element in our grids. Any other data which we can use in order to simulate have, uh, the artificial intelligence and whatsoever can be better protected and are less dangerous in case of being uh, attacked uh, to interfere with the performance of the grid. This is uh, uh, as a working, um, um, uh, as a first step, uh, certainly the right thing to do. Um, what we also will uh, see is um, and do is investing, of course, in technologies which are not as exposed from a physical point of view to this threat, and that's edge computing. And I do, uh, we foresee that there will be a, a, a really a dramatic change in our automation technologies in the grid. We will have more intelligence in the product and at the site itself using edge computing and also if you wish more decision power and control power, uh, thereby de-risking uh, the big control centers uh, uh, and their potential access to the cloud. So much more automation and, and edge computing at site. Um, in, in new, in, yes, that is from our perspective the future. It's revolutionary so far. Yeah. Who that? Uh, absolutely, uh, and 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 Mohammed, for example, you, I mean, Beatrix mentioned the importance of having a cybersecurity charter at the same time, so having guidelines that are uh, that are that are provided both you know by companies and also uh, by governments. Uh, the UAE is one of the most connected uh, countries in the world, and and so is its energy system. How are you thinking about cybersecurity? I mean, when we talk about the energy sector. Uh, as Mike said earlier, it's the backbone of any economy. So you need to protect and you need to invest your assets. And the way you do it is you need to closely monitor and regulate, provide the right regulations and incentives to make sure that each operator, each company uh, puts enough efforts to make sure to protect its assets from cyber security, uh, cyber attacks. And what we do is always that we work with our partners uh, here locally and internationally to make sure that we are on top of um, on top of things basically when it comes to technology updates. So we are investing and we are encouraging our operators to invest and making sure that they are up to date. We encourage our suppliers when, to, when it comes to equipment suppliers uh, to make sure that they the technologies that are installed in our uh, power plants that are uh, as updated as possible. This is uh, something that need, you need to monitor all the time and keep a close eyes and put the right regulations and policies 
to push the companies to um, invest more and hopefully protect your assets in the future. Thanks very much. And I, and I understand we have um, a, a speaker or, or keynote speaker from Egypt is, is on the line. But Mike, please, I would love to hear at the end uh, from you on this question of cybersecurity. Beatrix mentioned uh, the grid edge, which is really uh, where your company is very active. Uh, how are you considering some of these security issues uh, from the control system point of view? Yeah, you know, I'd say first and foremost, um, you know, cybersecurity is almost becoming a misnomer. It's, it's cyber resiliency, right? We are going to, I think we've, we've found that the, the actors are trying to do their best to disrupt. I think our companies have learned a lot in these last few years. Um, I think they're learning to manage episodes, keep them minimal from an impact standpoint. You know, what we're trying to do is, you know, a lot of our computing, so our control systems, the things that are in our assets, the things that are real time, they run at high speed, you know, they can't have latency, you gotta, you gotta stay focused on the process. Uh, the edge compute piece of that will be those, those important connections for, you know, getting the data we all wanna have to, to assess things and understand things, but at the same time, the cyber strategies have to be effectively built into, I think, all of the products and all of the systems. Mohammed, I'm sure, witnessed that and asked those questions. And I think generally our utilities are spending more money now in building their technical competence or building their expertise. You know, they're getting the staff uh, to the point where they, they can be much more effective in that. I would say that I think the cyber hygiene, you know, there's kind of a cultural piece of this, Philip, that we see in our customers' uh, organizations. I think of building that whole customer culture around cyber is, is another really critical aspect and we're starting to see progress there. Uh, Mohammed, you referenced keeping our systems up to date. We are seeing behavioral change in that area. For a long time, people had their systems and they're running and going great. And then all of a sudden, now people want to stay current because the cyber is really driving the behavior, I think, as we go forward. So Philip, those are kind of some of the things that we're witnessing right now in the cyber world. Thanks, Mike, so much. Um, we're going to wrap up this panel now uh, so that we can move on quickly to our uh, keynote speaker who's come uh, from the uh, Republic of Egypt. Uh, so uh, Mr. Mohammed Hillel Al-Zabi, uh, Dr. Beatrix Natter, uh, and Michael Train, it's been such a pleasure to have you here uh, on our panel and for your participation uh, to the Global Energy Summit. Uh, we've uh, really enjoyed having you, so thanks so much. Uh, now I'm going to pass it over to Ahmed Mahena, the first Undersecretary of Research and International Cooperation at the Ministry of Electricity and Renewable Energy of the Arab Republic uh, of Egypt. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, this Distinguished delegates, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and first of all, I would like to convey the greetings and uh, best wishes of Dr. Mohammed Shaker uh, Maccabi, Egyptian Minister of Electricity and uh, Renewable Energy. He would like to attend this important meeting, but unfortunately, due to sudden circumstances, he couldn't join you in this uh, meeting. Uh, and on my uh, on behalf of the government of Egypt, and indeed on my behalf, I would like to express my deep gratitude for, uh, to all of you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, while our meeting today comes at a critical moment uh, where the entire world is struggling to address the challenge caused by COVID-19 pandemic, urgent action could be taken to ensure sustainable energy is an integral part of the global COVID-19 response. Furthermore, the crisis underscores the need for reliable, sustainable, and affordable energy access. Several barriers can block needed investment in energy sector. These include lack of transparency, low level of involvement, uh, involvement of private sector, a fragmented legal and regulatory framework, significant subsidy, unclear institutional uh, architecture in some countries, and lack of regulatory incentives mechanisms. It is well recognized that promoting a sound legal and regulatory framework is a must to increase the chance of energy infrastructure, infrastructure projects to receive investments. Ladies and gentlemen, let me briefly share with you what Egypt has done to address that matter and to create an enabling environment for energy transition in Egypt. 
During the last few years, the electricity sector in Egypt has grown rapidly to meet the growing increased demand and to overcome the raised challenges. Security and the reliability of electricity supply has been on the top priorities of the government, government agenda. Since 2014 till now, the total capacity added, added to the grid reached more than 228 gigawatt after, after power deficit in 2014 and shortage approximately from 14, uh, 15 to 20% of the maximum load. Currently, we are focusing on the improvement and upgrading the transmission and distribution networks, including extra high voltage, substations, control centers, as well as smart grids, with investment reached about 4 billion US dollar. Our strategy is relying on transition and to, uh, to smart grids, which will contribute significantly to improve electricity efficiency and reduce carbon emissions, as well as reduce the investment required for infrastructure for electrical networks. Ladies and gentlemen, Egypt is rich in renewable energy resources, especially wind and solar, that qualify is to be one of the major renewable energy producers. There is about uh, 7,650 kilometers square that have been allocated for implementing renewable energy projects with expected potential of 90 gigawatt from, when, from renewable energy. To utilize this potential and integrated sustainable energy strategy for 2035 was approved in which the share of the renewable energy in the energy mix will reach 42 percent by 2035. Now we will achieve one year ahead of that schedule our first target by reaching uh, 20 percent from the expected uh, maximum peak load. To achieve our ambitious vision in utilizing the renewable resources, a lot of procedures have been taken to encourage private sector participation in the energy sector projects. As a result, a 32 per international and the local investors were involved to implement Bimban Solar Park projects, the largest one in the MENA region, located in one place, in Aswan, with total capacity 1,465 megawatt. The project won the best, the project prize worldwide by the World Bank. It is worth to mention that the latest price we got under the BOO scheme are $2 cent per kilowatt hour for solar energy and $3 cent for wind. Ladies and gentlemen, there are many opportunities for investors and the private sector to participate in the regional plan for the implementation of traditional projects, renewable energy projects, especially wind and solar, and the development of transmission and distribution networks. Recently, we are working in different technologies that will help us in our energy transition way. We waste, we waste uh, as waste to energy, e-mobility, green hydrogen, smart grids, water desalination, using renewable energy and energy storage. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, severe unlikely event like COVID-19 may occur in the near future to any country. Hence, responsibilities and need to be realized and the steps need to be taken promotely which would prefer a progressive impact. Until today, many utilities and operators have been operating the sectors, operating the conventional mechanisms and styles of management. As the pandemic situation has exposed the third weakness, it is high time policymakers, experts, and all stakeholders recognizing the integration of modern technologies mechanisms and materials. Yes. Thank, thank you minutes. very much. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, it, I, it's very clear. I mean that Egypt, as you underscored, um, is making great strides uh, in integrating reliable uh, energy access with the kind of technological 
uh, uh, solutions that we've been hearing about on this panel, as we've heard the technology is there, the investment is there. And while the pandemic was a test, it's clear that it's offered new roads uh, to eventually get to net zero electricity systems. So thank you everyone for joining this outstanding discussion uh, on building a more resilient system. And now I'd like to uh, hand it over to Etna Trainer uh, in our UAE studio uh, to introduce uh, our next panel. Please, Etna.